So I'm a journalist uh, and an activist, uh, a lifelong socialist. The reason I came to politics, to be brutally honest, is it's just a very long family tradition. It goes back to, you know, my great granddad was in the general strike in 1926. He was a train driver and he had his wages docked, which I still intend to get revenge for at some point. Um, my great uncle was on the football team of the Independent Labour Party, which left the Labour Party in the 30s. My granddad joined the communists uh, as a dot worker in Portsmouth in the 1940s and my parents met through the militant tendency which was a Trotskyist group which um, entered the Labour Party in the 1970s and the 1980s and my dad was the South Yorkshire organiser for the militant for several years including during the miners strike. Well I was first kettled when I was 16 and uh, that was in Manchester in 2001. It was a May Day protests and I think there was just a few hundred people protesting that day and the police kettled us and said, demanded to know who the representatives, who the leadership were, which everyone thought was hilarious and they kept us there for ages and then I was finally released but I remember some police officers made us sit on the ground and had to wait and uh, I made um, a slightly immature comment about the shoe size of the police officer and thought maybe conclusions could be drawn from that and uh, so I stopped and searched as a result of it in quite an aggressive way by one of his colleagues. Big moment, of course, for people particularly uh, of our generation was the anti-war movement and stop the war. And I must have marched dozens of times. I marched the big, the first big one, which was in September 2002 in London, when even then huge numbers of people came to the streets. But it was, of course, the 15th of February 2003 and an absolutely freezing cold day. And it wasn't really a march because it was just so many people. It was more of a shuffle. The sorts of people who'd never dream of going on a demonstration otherwise, uh, who were there with a sense of defiance and a sense that there's no way, no way they'll be able to go to war with so many people on the streets. And uh, odd how it now looks to say that looking back. But the end of that was a kind of jubilation almost. <laughs> such an unprecedented act of defiance with no one, no demonstration history in Britain even close to that size and of course they won't be able to go to war in Iraq which then happened anyway but I continued to be involved in all the protests even the months afterwards during the war itself so that was something I was very much threw myself into like so many other, I suppose, other young people. Well, I think demonstrations themselves I still think are, are really important, they're really important because lots of people across the country you want to show that anger um, won't basically get involved beyond demonstrations just not for them and if you want to ensure the biggest number of people on the streets then standard demonstrations have to be a part of that but of course it's not either or because the argument against that as people you know I go to schools now and talk to young people I often do talks in schools and these are kids who were six seven eight years old when the Iraq war began but they will still say back to me, hang on a minute, how if they defied too many people on the streets in 2003, is there anything we're going to be able to do politically to change the situation we're in? And these are people who are aware that their future, they're going to be worse off than their parents. They face a future of debt and insecurity, of ever declining living standards, of not being able to get an affordable home, of you know everything from workfare schemes to zero hour contracts. And yet they have a sense of despair and they talk about a demonstration they weren't even on as a reason for why they can't get politically active. When the coalition came to power, there was a sense that the British aren't like the hot-headed Greeks and French, almost. They won't come out on the streets, they won't fight back, they won't organise. And what proved that wrong was the students in November 2010 and it was predicted when that demonstration was called, following the trebling of tuition fees and the scrapping of the educational maintenance allowance for poorer students, it was predicted about 20,000 to 30,000 people would turn up. Westminster today during a mass demonstration against plans to increase university tuition fees. 52,000 people turned up and people there, for, many people, those young people, probably most of them had never been on a demonstration and they were aware of their own potential power for the first time and you had the occupation of Millbank, which became kind of iconic and caused a huge stir. And what that did is became the launch pad for a whole wave of occupations and acts of direct action. There were dozens of campuses right across the country who did that. 
And that was a real kickstarter for others because trade unionists looked at them and thought, hang on a minute, if these young people can take part in these sorts of protests and, and swell in these numbers and occupy and all the rest of it, then we should learn from what they've done. So that was really what began any sort of resistance to what the coalition's done and austerity in this country. It was the direct action of young people and that was something I was very proud to be part of. It was evolved in, in, in a local hospital up in Archway which was facing privatisation and cuts. We've had Lewisham Hospital as well, so you've got those localised um, protests as well. And Lewisham, they've been successful. And there's other examples. There's um, the electricians who went on strike against Balfour Beatty, one of the great multinational companies. And they didn't just go on strike, they took part in occupations and direct action. So, and they won. And all of these show that it is possible to win. Um, and they're different strategies. It's not demonstrations, direct action and so on. Strikes as well. But it shows it is possible to go out and organise and win and that's what, if the anti-austerity movement's going to be successful, we can't just wallow in defeats. We have to talk about those victories. We have to not think of strategies of being in conflict with each other, but complementing each other, that people should go off and do their own thing and work together when they can on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And I think that's what we're doing. I think, actually, people realise the stakes are high when, you know, we've got a million people dependent on legal loan sharks, we've got half a million people driven to food banks for the seventh richest country on earth, and we have the longest fallen living standards since the Victorian era. We just can't afford to fall out with each other. It doesn't matter how peaceful those protests will be, the media is not on your side. The media will do everything it can to demonise you, to attack you, either just ignore protests altogether and pretend they haven't happened, or to focus on any outbreak of of, of so-called disorder and portray that in the worst and most negative way and that goes back a very long way. In 1984 police officers on horseback uh, charged at miners and beat them up and then uh, changed the witness statements in the way they would later do at Hillsborough uh, smearing those responsible. It was an act of state violence against working people fighting for their, for their jobs. The BBC ran the tape in, different, in a different order from actually what the events took place were to make it look like the miners had attacked the police. Tonight, police put on display some of the weapons they say were used against them. There's talk about riot shields and riot helmets. That simply is protection for the officers. This was a very infamous example of outright media... Well, they were just lying. It was literally just a lie. The advantage we have today is social media because I still think... I use this as an example about how social media, how effective it can be. If during the Battle of Orgreave people had phones and Twitter and they could video what was going on and then tweet it out, it would have been a lot harder for the police to be able to uh, work with the media in the way they did to stitch up the miners and make it look like they're the victims. So I think protesters have to really be savvy about using mobile phones and, and, and social media and video and photos. That's how we know what happened to Jodie McIntyre, who was obviously taken out of his wheelchair in a protest. That's how we know what happened to Ian Tomlinson, who was killed by um, um, a police officer throwing him to the ground. Uh, it's how we know about numerous other examples of police brutality. So we need to use that as effectively as possible because the media, as I say, is not on the side of protesters and will demonise them, and that, that includes the BBC. It includes almost all of the main newspapers. Look at the success of UK Uncut, which organised against uh, tax avoidance, the refusal of some of the biggest companies and wealthiest people in our society uh, to pay the taxes they're expected to pay, uh, which costs, what, £25 billion each year. And that has a direct impact, of course, on you and your members because that means your services are being slashed. Uh, it means uh, many of your members will be sacked as a result. Uh, and during an unprecedented fall in living standards, with austerity partly being justified by a lack of money, uh, that will have a huge impact on the people that you represent and UK and Cut have very successfully forced that issue on the agenda and that's something to take inspiration from. That's to go, actually, we haven't managed to put tax avoidance on the agenda with the sorts of strategies we've had, but these people, by taking part in the very proud and noble tradition of peaceful civil disobedience, have done exactly that and we should take heart from that and learn from that, even if we're not prepared to do that ourselves, to occupy shops and businesses, though I hope, of course, they would think about doing that as a way of reinvigorating their own sort of approach to politics. What you're doing is, 
inspirational and, and, and will push issues on the agenda which are otherwise ignored but also to look at the trade unions as the biggest democratic movement in the country representing over six million workers as they do who are there at the front line when it comes to fighting to you know for people to have decent wages they can live on to fight against unscrupulous bosses who treat their workers uh, in the most terrible way possible uh, that trade unions have organized successfully in the past for everything from the weekend to the welfare state and the nhs these are all things which partly grow out of campaigns of trade unions and therefore yeah sometimes it looks a bit bureaucratic or a bit slow or or the process the internal process of trade unions seems a bit just a bit dull and a bit gray and trade unions have to come a long way still in terms of representing women and bme people for example and making sure they're actually representative of society uh, but they have achieved huge gains and they're your allies and you should see them as your allies and trade unions have backed many of those campaigns like uk and cult which they've been very active in supporting people might say well peaceful civil disobedience uh, even that will put people off. I don't think it will. I don't think UK and Cut are regarded as, as awful people when you even had the Daily Mail giving them positive coverage because they knew that they're largely uh, small-c, conservative, lower-middle-class readers resented the fact that people richer than them weren't paying their taxes, so they had to give them positive coverage. So just because they found an issue, which basically no one sensible or anyone with any basic reason uh, could argue against then their tactics just helped to drive that issue up the agenda uh, and it worked and that shows how and we've got to keep talking about this it is a proud tradition in this country the gains and rights we have were not given to us by the goodwill and generosity of those above they were won through the struggle and sacrifice of people from below and all the gains and rights we have weren't weren't won just because people did a few a to b marches and voted at general elections it took place because people took part in peaceful civil disobedience sometimes not so peaceful the suffragettes weren't always peaceful and they were demonized as violent anarchists at the time i mean they were reviled and and, and hated by the mainstream media and home secretaries would stand up in the house of commons and and, and joke about how they should be allowed to starve to death. They've always been demonised protesters. We've always got to remember that. But history vindicated all of these people, and that shows they, that it worked. That you should expect, if you're effective, you should expect to be demonised and attacked, whatever you do. And that means being confident about your tactics, even when you, you, know, you end up with the media just lying about you. And that's a horrible thing when you take part in a protest. You go home, you turn on the TV, and it's like you're just looking at a parallel universe. But that is inevitably always going to happen. Taking part in peaceful disobedience is a crucial thing to do. It works, it does work. And you shouldn't fear the consequences of the media demonising you for doing so, because actually you will drive issues up the agenda. Most people think, hang on a minute, I don't think it's people sitting in shops who are the problem here. I think it's the fact that their owners aren't paying taxes when I have to pay my taxes.